Hello. For the past 10 years, I've worked for web agencies for a university, for whatever reason, also as a UX consultant on many projects from the automotive industry to European institutions, banks, investment companies. Something started happening over and over again, especially with the UX consultancy where I arrived in the middle of those projects, which was on more and more of those projects, it turns out that a UI framework was chosen and they built it, the project with it. And I was simply expected to kind of put some paint on whatever was built. But my job as a designer isn't that. My job is to try to find the best solutions to, use, to solve my user problems. So today, this is kind of what I want to share with you. First, a little bit of definition, so we are on the same page. So I'm going to use the word UI framework a lot. For me, those are UI frameworks. So it's basically this kind of library of generic UI components. You can have components in Bootstrap. You have some in Material UI, Ionic, and things like that. So this help us obviously build products. We can see them as kind of a toolbox, maybe, for designers and developers. I wanted to start by telling you a story of one of my projects. Mr. Client has had a really good idea. I can't name the client. <laughs> so Mr. Client, he wanted to teach uh, children how to learn music. So he wanted to build an iPad app for the teacher. They would be able to take small recordings of little pieces of the lesson. And then he wanted to build kind of a platform on the web where students could connect and then check for the small little videos, connect with each other, things like that. Sounded like a nice project. To build this, he needed a team to help him. So he asked my agency. We had a team of developers and a team of de designers. He also asked an iOS agency to build the, uh, the iPad app. In one of those meetings, I ended up asking the big question, which is, by the way, you really want a question tasked with, by the way, it's already that. But so, by the way, who will take care of the design of the iPad app? We decided that our agency will do it since the iOS team didn't have designers in house. We were thinking, okay, this is great, right? But we were not on the same page. For us, we will take care of the design meant something like we will do user research, build wireframes, build detailed UI mockups, and then they will code the thing. For the iOS agency, it meant something around, well, we'll do something with our UI framework, and then the designers will put some paint. Since no one said that aloud during the meeting, well, this happens. A few days after, they told us, like, OK, this is the prototype we built. No, do the design. And they showed us the prototype. <laughs> like, do the design, true. The issue with that is that I can't really explain to you the, the app in details, but basically they used a tab bar navigation, which kind of makes sense for iPad app at that time. But this didn't make sense for our app. The users needed more than um, 14 different actions to be able to accomplish their goal. We kept calm, <laughs> kind of, and asked, so, OK, can we make maybe some design suggestions to improve the usability? Sure, but we can't build com custom components, so stick to the framework. What framework? <laughs> like, so this is when finally we got the full story. Due to deadlines and budget, the iOS development team decided to use an uh, iOS framework they usually use on their projects. So the only navigation component they had was this tab bar, and this clearly wasn't working for our users. We made some suggestions, and most of them were refused. So at this point of the project, it was something like, just put some paint, make it look nice and pretty. And nice and pretty and shiny it was. Um, it was all flat design. This was the beginning of flat design. It was huge at the time. A little bit like the lemon juice, the same we saw this morning. It was a really nice object, you know, like super conversation starters. And Mr. Klein was actually happy with the nice object. So he did what everyone would do. He went to the users and he showed them the, the nice object. This was a disaster. 
No one understood how it worked. Even worse, when Mr. Klein explained it to them, they were super frustrated. So we tried to rework the user flow. We were able to kind of turn it in, uh, from 15 to eight steps. We built a new navigation system, but after discussing with the development team, it was decided that this would require more budget, so more money on the table for the clients, and also we would like change the deadlines. In the end, the investors refused, so uh, we were just asked like, the pretty but not usable app, it should do the job. We will implement your design in the ver next version. This means never, <laughs> usually in most projects. The app was published for a short time, other things happened. This is a story for another time. If I would kind of try to do the curve of this story, it would kind of look something <laughs> like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, what did happen? Looking back, I'm, I wondered like, okay, I identified a few things. First, my users, they were not involved in the early stages. When they were finally involved, it was too late. Second, like designers and developers on this project clearly didn't speak the same language. That happens a lot on projects. Finally, there was no real collaboration around this project, and especially around the usage of this secret framework no one heard about. Project happened some years ago, but the whole put some paint on top of that at the end, this is something I get asked to do a lot, me and my teams. I can't blame UI frameworks. They're just tools, they're neither good or bad. And actually, UI framework can be quite useful. As developers, you might know that. Like, you can build a quick MVP, have a prototype, go really, really fast to market. It can also help with, like, making sure the code is consistent, like the design patterns are consistent. So if we can't blame the tools, maybe we should blame the process. I started wondering, what can, uh, do, can we find better solutions than th to that? How might we as designers still work with those UI tools, but try to put our users back into the center of this project? I don't have a perfect answer. <laughs> All I can do is try to kind of show you how I work, some of the mistakes I make, and hope it gives you some ideas for your own projects. So first, don't skip user research, ever, period. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay, but, but we don't have UX people, but we don't have the time, but we don't have the budget, but, but, but we love to find our, ourselves some excuses. A lot of people can actually be responsible for building or destroying the user experience of your projects. Front-end people, when they are building buttons that don't work, even worse, when they are building buttons that don't work on keyboard navigation, they're destroying the user experience. Developers, when they are just throwing out the database as key values into these big forms, this is a really crappy user experience. And if you can destroy it, maybe you can build it and make it better. So in short, everyone in your team is responsible at some point, at some level, for the user experience of your products. And if you want to control the budget, well, you might as well put all of those people around the table at the beginning of the project and make them talk to each other. And here are a few ideas, um, places where you can actually find user feedback if you, if you don't have budget. Support teams, they're in the front rows with users. You have maybe support tickets, emails, they may have users over the phone. Try to turn this into valuable information about what are your user requesting, what are their frustrations. Also, on some of my products, I have sales teams and training teams. Those people also get to meet the users, so they can bring you valuable information as well. Forums, social networks, online reviews on Android Market on Apple Store. What are people saying about your product online? What are they complaining about? What are the pain points? Even better, what are they saying about your competition? <laughs> Because if you want to innovate, don't just follow them. Try to stay ahead. Solve their problems before um, they can do it. 
I had someone send me uh, an email. He knew that I was using a specific product. And he asked me, like, OK, you're using this product. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, 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 that? He was just doing user research. He wanted to know my pain point because he was building a competition for this product. If you're redesigning something, you might already have some data like analytic tools, but also like backend data from user accounts, things like that. So dig into this data. You want to know who are my users, demographics, user groups, things like that. What do they do? What pages are they visiting? How often? Are they visiting those pages? What are the current flows? Like, how do they go from one page to the other? This should remind you of a few things that Joe was talking to you about. Uh, also, an interesting thing is what devices or browsers are they using? Because this might impact the, cha the choice of the framework. Do we need responsive? We should need that. But yeah. Also, depending on your project, you might be able to meet your users in some area. One bank in Luxembourg, not one I was working for, but still, was uh, they launched a whole afternoon of Garia design. So what they did is they took a bunch of developers, of designers, of project owners, and they asked us to go into the lobby of a big cinema and ask questions to people about how they were using banking applications. Something quite interesting turned out they discovered that a lot of people wanted a feature they didn't think about. What could that be? In a banking app. Sorry? Could be. <laughs> but no. You know you have this kind of withdrawal limit. Usually you have a default one, which is not zero. The default one is something set by the bank. A lot of people actually wanted to go under this withdrawal limit sometimes. Because you are on holiday, you don't want to spend too much money. Because you misplaced your card, but you're not quite sure it was stolen, and you just want to put these limits to zero until you find the card again, things like that. And no one, no analyst, no developer, no project owner in the team thought about this feature. And yeah, an afternoon of research is quite a cheap price to pay when you want to launch your product with the right features. If you can go to the users, maybe you can do something remotely like video calls, WhatsApp, Slack, direct conversation, like a synchronous conversation. Also, email is a nice solution. I would just advise you, don't send all the questions. It's supposed to be a discussion with the users. So send one question, then wait for the reply, send the other one, something like that. So the user research will give us a lot of data. And what we want to analyze here and identify is who they are, what are their goals. They're not using your app or your service because you have a pretty logo. <laughs> That'd be a bonus, but still, they want to do something with that. There's a goal here. What are the tasks, the activities they need to do to achieve those goals? What are their main pain points? And with that, this helps me as a UX designer to build something we call user flow. A user flow is a map of all the different steps users will need to take into, uh, to complete those goals. So this one for, was for a mobile uh, app. This is an interesting document because it lets us understand what kind of pages do we need, but also how does a user go from one page to the other. My first tip here is try to involve the development team when you do that. Because in many of my projects, this kind of document ended up becoming kind of a roadmap for them. Because with this document, they understand how to build the logic behind the, the app or the services. Also, it helps avoid dead ends. QI people, business analysts, might also have some valuable information here. So try to involve them as well. Those user flow helped us identify what pages do we need. No, I need to decide what goes on each of those pages. What type of content will I have? What content or what elements will help me solve my user needs? What will be the navigation like? Something like that. When we redesign something existing, it's a little bit easier. We can do something Brad called an inventory inter interface inventory. So I'm not kind of interested in the different types of buttons here. I'm more interested in knowing, okay, 
this page used to have this, 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 and these components. Does it still need that do we, when we redesign? Do we keep it or do we change it? And on your projects, it's even more important to do your user research because this will be really your base with the user research you will know and it will help you decide what kind of content do I need. So for the moment, this was mostly framework agnostic. Learning from all my previous mistakes, I would say if the client, the developer team decides to use a specific framework, designers have to know about this as soon as possible. Even better, choosing a framework should actually be a, uh, should actually be a team decision, not just a developer decision. Like discuss with the designers, discuss with product managers. And it's better usually to discuss this after some analysis or user research was done. Because the choice of the framework and the choice of the UI components will impact the user experience in the end, like it did for Mr. Client. So my main advice, if you're a designer, don't wait for the information, don't do like we did. Try to go and ask up front, find the right person and ask them, are we going to use a framework on that or not? And then you want to know what's in the kitchen before starting to plan the meal. So usually what we do at this stage is we take a first look at the framework. We want to know on a really, really global level, what kind of UI components do we have? Also, are they accessible? Are they responsive? Are there guidelines for navigation flows, things like that? And now frameworks have quite interesting documentation. This is an Angular UI framework and every page, no, every component comes with documentation for design guidelines Arr. and code and examples. Also, what I really liked is documentation like Ionic because I can see what the components will look like and also how do they behave. So this helps me as a designer decide if this component is actually going to solve my user needs. Once we know what's in the kitchen, let's start planning the meal. So this is where we usually try to use the components, but also challenge them and try to build some prototypes of wireframes. On a specific product, we did some user research and tried to understand how and what kind of filter people will need into an advanced search. And it turns out they needed to be able to filter statuses. So we kind of needed checkboxes. We checked for the components and we had them. So this was an easy example, of course. Sometimes it's not that easy because naming convention can be hard. So if you don't know if a component exists, as a designer, maybe ask the developer team if they're familiar with the framework. Because this, like I wanted this component, I was searching for alert, I was searching for notification. At some point I was like, okay, maybe message will do it. No, I needed to search for toast, obviously. Or a snack bar, if you're using material design, or banners, or alerts, and like, what's going on with food here? Like, Google also, also has ships and things like that. So naming convention is complicated, and if you don't own that one, you might as well ask. Speaking about collaboration and asking, I really like to try to turn this into a group exercise. So this is a crazy eight session, usually it scares my developers. We challenge them, we challenge ourselves, we challenge to try to find eight different design solutions to a specific user problem. Usually most people find four or five, which is already amazing. Then we put together the solutions and discuss like, what's the most suitable solution? Is it this component or this one? And usually it's then a compromise between complexity, experience and budget. Sometimes the UI components you have will not solve your user needs. And here is an example of what might happen if you try to force it. Uh, so the building uh, has four floors. The elevator UI component has 10 floors. Obviously, this is not the right design solution. But they still tried to make it work. So what they did is like they put those red little labels. So if you want to go to um, second, say, uh, second floor, you press five or six. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Also, it's not accessible anymore. Like the blind people will never be able to use that kind of thing. So don't be the elevator. And don't quote that on Twitter, <laughs> out of context. 
don't distort your user problem and don't try to make them fit into your solution because this will not work. I wait for the pictures. <laughs> okay. Um, my advice here, instead of doing that, try to challenge the components. Like text fields in material UI, this might work on really small um, text fields. But when you have 25 different forms, uh, fields into one form, welcome to banking industry. And some of those forms are already pre-filled. It's kind of complicated to use and it doesn't work. So what we did here, we used the framework. We, again, discussed with developer, challenged it, and this is the solution we came up with. So this was discussed budget-wise, and then we decided all together to completely change the components and always have the label. So you usually need like the knowledge of both parties, like collaboration of both designers and developers to actually choose the right components. Based on the previous user research we did, um, and on the challenged components, what I was able to do is some really quick paper wireframes and then my developers, who are amazing, put together a demo in like less than a day. And this is amazing because I was able to conduct usability testing on this quick demo. Whether you're challenging or not the UI components, you still want to make sure that the components you decided to use are going to work for your users. And this is actually where UI framework are a really cool solution here. Because you have already this code somewhere, it means you can build it pretty quickly and you can do usability testing. You don't need the database for that. You want to test the interface. Depending on the project, then I sometimes also do like really detailed wireframes. And then what I like to do is try to list the component we decided to use. This way, at least the developers know where the components will be, like the second column is uh, the different pages, and what kind of components we are going to use. So for the moment, I have wireframes or paper wireframes, prototypes. I have the visual identity of the UI framework. If I'm using material design, I'm currently using Google's visual identity. Maybe that works for you, but for many of my clients, they actually want their visual identity, their logo, their colors, their fonts, their icon. So this is where you start trying to think about how might we style those components. So as a designer, it's really tempting to change it all. Like, yeah, I want to change all the styles. Uh, it might be complicated, so I asked around, and if you want to come and discuss afterwards, I would be super interested into your advice on that. So I asked what can be easily customized to a few developers, and they told me like everything that you can put into a variable can be customized quite easily, usually. Colors, fonts, shadows, radiuses, things like that. Also easy, but it depends on how the framework was built. Paddings, margin, spacing, container width, things like that. So, if you want to customize the colors, but you don't have a designer in house, or you're not really good at picking <laughs> colors, I should have completed the sentence, uh, you can use color palette tools. But I would like to warn you again, this might look super pretty, but most of those are not accessible. So make sure again, check those contrasts and make sure you won't have any accessibility issues if you use this kind of colors. It's also quite easy usually to change the fonts. But again, if you don't know what kind of fonts you could use, uh, this online site like this one that will help you with the font pairing, my advice here is like pick one family and different width. Also not too many, otherwise you will have to load a lot of different fonts. So performance issues. And also avoid thin. They might look super pretty on a MacBook on Sketch, but on some computers, especially like old screens, it's a nightmare. So avoid using the really thick version of your fonts. Huh, icons. I don't want to enter into the, font, the icon font versus SVG debate, OK? But basically, it will depend on your framework. Sometimes it's easy because the, it was built and you can quite easily change them. Sometimes it's not. So what I would suggest is like, if you're using an icon font, stick to it. Don't do like some of my developers where we had font awesome, then someone decided to use glyph icon, then a third one. And on some of those pages, we would have three different kind of bins because I don't know, <laughs> but don't do that. Try to stick to one icon font pack. Also, you might not need an icon for everything. 
Explicit labels are usually better than clumsy icons, like Joe explained a little bit earlier. So make sure that actually <laughs> this can be used. Built-in specific behaviors like animation, things that are really in the heart of your framework, might be complicated to change though. Also, for some reason, like adding new content sometimes and also removing it because the components when built into a certain way might be complicated as well. So what I would advise you if you want to change this kind of things is like first usually ask the front-end developers about that and discuss this maybe in the prototyping phase not in the UI phase, but sometimes UI designers like to re-challenge things. So in the, in the prototype phase, we needed a timeline. We asked the developers and they told us like, you can use the stepper in material UI. So we used it in the prototype phase. It looked like that, it was okay. And then in the UI phase, we decided that the date here was a little bit complicated to see because it was in the title. So we put it outside of the title <laughs> in the UI phase. So you have the date here now. And this is a structure change. And I'm not saying it was, it's impossible, but it was quite a challenge to some of our developers because of the way this was built. So my advice is like just a minor change for a designer might not be a minor change for the developers. So don't try to guess again, sit together, discuss these kinds of things because communication is key. <laughs> And yes, your generic UI framework, you decided to use like Materi UI, Bootstrap, Angular, with and something like that. It is slowly becoming your own product's custom UI library. Also, it could maybe at some point be the beginning of a design system or something. So you want to document this and you want to share it. Why? First reason is consistency. It will help you onboard new designers on the team. Like if you have this kind of shared documents with all the UI components, it's easier for them to build new design mockups. Also, sharing it and documenting it will help developer understand and respect the design decision you, you take. And your future self will, will thank you. When in a few months you might wonder like, why did we pick that component again? So usually what we like to document is different components. Like this is starting to look like a style guide with all my documents, uh, my components that are now customized. Also when to use it. When do I need a primary ac um, action versus a secondary one? How do the collapsing panels work? What's the arrow, is it down or up? Huge debate. Document this so that in the new view, at least everyone will have their hour the same way. Also, I like to document how they work. Like for um, forms, for instance, how does it work when we have like the form focus, when there's an error, when we have it filled, things like that. And don't forget about responsiveness. Because your components might live in other areas, like you design them for this specific product, but then someone will use it in another product of your company. They might end up in a sidebar, so you might need a smaller version. Or you're designing component for an iOS app, and then they decide to do um, an iPad app, so landscape, portrait, bigger, smaller, things like that. This is also stuff you want to document. And usually what I've discovered by working in a lot of different teams is every team has their kind of habits. So discuss with the developers about what kind of handoffs do they expect? Like, do you want SVG for the icon? Do you prefer PNG if you're doing like native app, things like that? Also, where do I put the files? <laughs> do I put it on Jira, on Git, on uh, GitLab, something like that, on a hard drive? because you're working at the bank and you're not allowed to have cloud tools, things like that. So try to make collaboration easy for everyone. And there's quite a few interesting tools to do that. So you have tools like Invention, Inspect, Zeppelin, Figma, all of those tools. The principle is the same, like you can um, inspect some components and then you get like the color, the fonts, things like that. You also get some CSS, 
but you might not want to copy paste this CSS because most of the time it's like static with and static positioning. So I would say use this to extract the values, but don't copy paste the CSS. We have a UI style guide with some UI components in the design team. We also have the same thing in the dev team. They should kind of match, be a match to each other. Don't keep your awesome work a secret. Share it. People in the company need to know it exists if you want them to use it. So it means, again, you'll need some tools and some places to share this kind of thing. I don't really have a perfect solution for that either. I know some people put this kind of thing on Jira, so they put the sketch file, but also the code documentation. I know some people use like repository, like GitLab, GitHub, Git, and I know some people who use a framework to, the, to document a framework. So they used a bootstrap to document the bootstrap, which was kind of funny because it led some, to some interesting issues about, is this part of the component or is this part of the documentation? So it might not be a good idea, but still it's an idea. Uh, some people use Dropboxes and things like that. I think Brad mentioned Storybook earlier. So the idea behind this is that it's a developer dependency and you can actually document a lot of things like you can document here all your UI library and you can also play with the components. Like what, would the, what will it look like if I add an icon, if I remove it? Why, what will it look like if I translate it to German with the big buttons, Think like, things like that? Yeah, German is one of my <laughs> major issues with Babton at the moment because it's way bigger than English. So you can stress test a little bit those components. While researching for this talk, I stumbled upon Uber's uh, Web React component library. It's called WebBase, no, Base Web. They decided to put it on GitHub. It's quite interesting. What I like about it is that they actually also document uh, what can be overridden. So here is like overrides. And then you can see that you can actually change the little arrows. As a designer, if you don't like them, well, you know, you can change them. As a developer, you also know that this is something that should quite easily be overridden. Documenting and sharing will help, but I noticed that this kind of process only works when you have some clear governments. So I'm sorry, but rules and responsibilities and people to enforce these kind of things into the projects. So who can modify, who can add, what happens when a component wasn't designed? Is it the job of the designer to do it? The job of the developer, hint, it's the job of the both people. And how do we update them? What happens if a component doesn't work anymore? And there's like hundreds of ton and ton of questions you need to answer to do that. So the idea is a UI library is not just a developer project. At this point, you need to kind of make this the project of everyone in your team, and you need to empower and involve everyone to make sure this works. So last but not least, my job as a designer is also to check the quality of the product. Since one of the main goals of a UI framework is to go quickly sometimes, my design team don't get to design like super specific mockups for all the pages. This is also why we have this um, user flow. Usually we take the user flow, we say, okay, this, 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 and this is super complex. We're going to do really detailed mockups with the components with those. This is kind of not that complex. So we'll just do a quick drawing, a sketch or something like a real sketch on paper. So the developer, they end up having to build some of the pages or some of the view in the case of an application using React Native from specifications or from even like paper wireframes. So we go from a raw dev version to something that is already quite better. So here they just used the UI framework so, and they applied it. This is better, but as a designer, <laughs> a few things are still bothering me. So that's why we do quality review. It's just like going around everything that was developed. Usually we do that after the demo and discussing with the developer about improvements, like maybe we could have had some padding or maybe like we still need to have a title like opening hours, something like that. 
This is also usually the time when we try to fine tune the animations because it's more easy to speak about animations when you have actually the product in your, in your hand and you're starting playing with the views than when you don't have anything uh, other than static mockups. So my last uh, advice to designers is in quality review, don't just complain about the fact that your developer didn't use the right button. Explain the design decision behind this kind of feedback. Like I had some developers who had to create um, a view and there were three different buttons. And like blue was primary, uh, gray was secondary. And of course he put everything in blue because he didn't really know. He didn't understand why do we have blue and gray. So what I did, I explained to him like, okay, what do you think is the main action here for our user? So yes, it's this one. So this is why we use primary button. So I kind of explained it all over again. And then he was able to do the next views and he would choose what's the primary button and he chose it in a pretty, really decent way. So kind of teach them to fish, something like that. Before launching the product, we also try to do some final usability testing to make sure that the decided decision we took during this whole process still work for our users once it was developed. So I also like to invite my developer team to do when I do this kind of things. This was a usability testing for a TV app. We wanted to make sure that they would understand the remote. They didn't. But <laughs> this, was a, this is another story for another project. But anyway, what was interesting here is that the developer got to see actual users using the app. And it's super empowering because then you kind of understand how the decision you made as a developer also are going to impact your users. So this is an interesting thing to do. Finally, part of the, my quality check is also to make sure that a component we chose at one moment of the project still works after a few changes. I chose German on purpose, it's an easy example. I didn't work on this one, I arrived and did a usability review. But what happened here is that they chose to use the tabs component, and maybe at the beginning it was working. So you have level one tab here. So I'm into identification of competence, first tab, and then I'm into Rechnen, uh, don't remember that one, something about taxes. But the crazy thing about that is this is actually more accessible to a screen reader because at least the screen reader can understand the structure. Here, as a user, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. So what actually happened is like, they chose to use tabs. It works at the beginning. Then page grew into complexity, user need changed. They added, added, added content. And at some point that doesn't work anymore. So developers, they're quite familiar with something called technical depth, and they do this whole refactoring of the code. I think as designers, we need to have something quite similar, which is like evaluate our components once in a while and make sure that they actually still work, and if they're not, refactor our UI as well. So this was my process as a designer when I and my teams have to work with a UI framework. As you've seen, it mostly comes down to communication and collaboration. And we're in 2019 and <laughs> designers are still saying that. So yes, it is possible to work with a UI framework and have a user-centric approach and process. But for me, building a great experience with such tool is a team effort and an interactive process. So developers, they should not be left alone choosing the components or the framework for that matter. This kind of decision needs to be based on user research and needs to be a team decision. Designers, they should not come at the end of the project to put some paint on top of those components. This is not our job. And we really, really, really need to stop doing this because everyone gets frustrated into this process, designers, developers. But the most frustrated people, person of all in this crappy process is the end users that will have to try to use something that is clearly not usable. 
So let's bring more communication and collaboration back to the process to make sure that what we build will be both usable and also will answer our user problems. So here is my process in a nutshell. I hope it will give you kind of some ideas on a little bit of inspiration if you need or your design team needs to go down the same road I went on many of my projects. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Will you join me, please? So the topic of designer developer, developer communication collaboration is one that is very near and dear to my heart because um, usually I'm the developer that joins the design team and um, sometimes I join early in the stages and sometimes I don't. Like there are certain technical things that, um, a couple of things that come to mind like SVG for example, if you don't collaborate with your designers from the start, you will lose probably a lot of time if the designer is using a specific tool that does not generate code that the developer can work with, then they're going to have to redo, which does happen sometimes, uh, which uh, basically a big waste of time. And then there's also accessibility today. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot of, um, it's one of the most controversial topics when it comes to designer and developer collaboration. So if a developer is trying to build something accessibly, the design is not accessible enough. Or if the design is accessible, but it hasn't been implemented accessibly. So we talk a lot about designer-developer collaboration, mm -hmm. and yet in the real world, we don't see that happening a lot. So no. why do you think that is? Uh, sometimes it's, it's mostly like if you have the people in two different buildings, for instance, in a company, it's like the designers, they're into the innovation team or marketing team. And the developers are in, in a completely other building. So just this kind of things, like I think designers, when you're working on a product like I do, you need to be into the middle of the team. You need to be able to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And also maybe developers might not be quite used to have designers ask questions, things like that. It took me a while to put the quality review. So at the beginning of the project, I wasn't even invited to the demos. So I had to fight. I went to the demos and then I explained and explained. And at the end of this kind of projects, I was super happy because the developer would come and show me what they built and ask, they asked for the feedback and things like that. So I think it takes time, but you need to have those people in the same like area. You can't have them in different buildings or things like that. Otherwise, yeah, that, that makes sense. So there's a question from Petra, um, questions about interviews. Are you sure that the person, when you're doing an interview, are you sure that the person will tell you what it is that he or she is really doing or thinking about some process or app, or will they tell you what they think that you want to hear? Is it not better mm -hmm. to just observe and get those info directly from, from their, their actions? Uh, first, it depends how you put the questions. This is the most complicated thing about doing an interview. It might seem quite easy, but like writing a question that's not going to bias your user Mm -hmm. is something so hard. You need to test and pretest and pretest those questions. So this, this, uh, I'm not sure it answers the, the question, but basically I would say like, of course, people will want to please you when you ask them questions. So you need to kind of combine all those things. Like Joe said, people say they want something, but they might want something else. Mm -hmm. But it's also your job as a designer, as a UX designer, to make sure that the question you are building are not going to kind of lead them. Like, do you like this feature? Well, yes or no? The end. So yeah. this kind of questions. So yeah, it's kind of real job and real, really, really complicated to have questions like that. Uh, okay, I guess that's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.